Howdy folks and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles and today we have a replay courtesy of B-Ball 617 in everyone's favourite tier 10 British light cruiser HMS Minotaur. Tier 10 battle obviously which is extremely bad news for the two carrier players in this match. B-Ball's team have HMS Implacable, the enemy team have the USS Lexington. Always a tough match for a tier 8 carrier when they find themselves in the tier 10 battle however one of these two carriers is going to make the most of his situation. The other one? Not so much. There are a couple of reasons why I picked this replay for today's video. First and foremost, of course, because B-Ball just plays an extremely good game. But also because it's a great example of a number of people making some very, very bad decisions. Some are so obviously bad that all you can really do is laugh at them. Others not necessarily bad decisions based on the information that may have been available to the people making those decisions at the time, but decisions that did end up being bad ones because they did not have all of the information that they needed to make a good decision. And when you don't have all of the information, you're not actually making a decision, what you're doing is taking a risk. Sometimes those risks pay off, and when they do, they do make for very exciting replays. A lot of the time, however, they don't and you just kind of end up looking stupid. Also, there's the fact that one of the carriers in this team, as mentioned, is going to take full advantage of the limited opportunities that a tier 8 carrier has in a tier 10 battle. The other is very definitely not. And then there's the way this particular battle ends. And it's going to end the way it does, no spoilers, because of another example of poor decision making. So, Settle back, strap yourselves in, grab your popcorn, ensure you have a tasty beverage to hand, and stand by. While everyone's jockeying for position at the beginning of the match, note how the two carriers are employing radically different tactics. The Lexington on the enemy team has sent out his dive bombers first. Now, when you're in a tier 8 carrier, and you're in a tier 10 battle, particularly at the beginning of the match, when all or most of the enemy ships have overlapping zones, of anti-aircraft fire support, you pretty much have to count on losing most, if not all, of that first squadron. Particularly if you're trying to do anything aggressive with it. The Lexington has basically thrown away pretty much his entire squadron of dive bombers. And that's going to be a problem for the Lexington, because the dive bombers constitute the Lexington's primary striking power. And he's really going to struggle to replenish that squadron when he actually needs it. B-Ball got momentarily spotted by the dive bombers there before he was able to shoot enough of them down. He's managed to go undetected, pop some torpedoes away, and he's gotten to where he wants to be. He's in cover behind this island. Now pay attention to what the Implacable has been doing. By contrast, he's been sending out his relatively disposable rocket attack planes as his first choice. And he's been using them to harass and contest the Bravo cap in the centre of the map against the enemy Tashkent destroyer, who's in the process of capping it. Unfortunately, with the possible exception of the friendly Baltimore all the way over on the western flank, it didn't look like anybody else was really taking the time out of their busy schedule to fire some shots at the Tashkent, aside from the Implacable. So he is actually going to capture B there, assisted, it has to be said, by the Lexington, who's dropped a defensive fighter squadron on his head, but B is definitely going to fall into the hands of the enemy team despite the best efforts of the friendly carrier. But, well, tier 8 carrier, there's a limit to what you can achieve, particularly in a tier 10 battle at the start of the match. One thing that he did achieve while he had his aircraft down there was to spot a whole bunch of enemy ships. But now that his aircraft are no longer down there, there's a distinct lack of spotting going on. In the meantime, the enemy Lexington, having lost almost all of his dive bombers at the beginning of the match, has sent out his rocket attack planes and used them to attack a big old blob of ships comprising of a Zhao, a Frederick the Great, and a Baltimore. A big old blob of ships which were nice and safe on the far side of an island and unable to be shot at by the rest of the Lexington's team, despite the fact that he was spotting them. So, basically he's just wasted another squadron of aircraft. Meanwhile, B-Ball, taking advantage of the spotting that was being done by the friendly Implacable, and then also taken advantage of the British cruiser's ability to ripple fire torpedoes here. You'll note that the firing arc of the narrow spread, if he'd fired it through the gap between those islands over there at that kind of range, would have meant that the outermost torpedoes on either side would have hit the islands. Effectively, since you're firing from two separate launchers, that would have wasted four torpedoes. 
because you can single fire the torpedoes, is able to precisely aim them through the gap in the hopes of catching that Al Sachi over there. The problem, of course, is that these French battleships are so incredibly fast. You have to give so much lead if they're going at full speed with that engine boost active. I mean, that's the kind of lead that you normally have to give to a destroyer. Look at this. <laughs> that, that's how fast those things can be. But he's adjusted his aim and he's once again continuing to do damage. His smoke screen? Yeah, might be time to start thinking about moving. Yeah, he's got not far short of a minute left on the smoke screen, but at the same time, the Minotaur is an extremely lightly armoured cruiser, and he's sitting in open water, and you don't want to be caught there with your guns blazing away when the smoke screen expires, particularly when there are no shortage of convenient islands all around that you can be using to take cover behind. So having that smoke screen in the Minotaur is great, but always have an exit strategy. Always know what you're going to do when the smoke screen expires before it happens. Now the crunched out on the team has just used his radar. So Russian radar doesn't last particularly long, but has extremely good range. And there's the Tashkent. He's captured Bravo as advertised. And it's here where B-Ball makes a, well, I don't want to say a bad decision, but it's a decision that I don't understand. He's got the Tashkent pinned against the island like a deer caught in the headlights of an oncoming car. He fires two salvos at the Tashkent and then immediately switches targets to this Yamato. Now the Yamato is closer and he's a much bigger target, therefore he's easier to hit. And I appreciate that the Tashkent immediately went to full speed and started manoeuvring and would have been a more difficult target to hit. But isn't he also a more valuable target to hit? He's the only destroyer on the enemy team. Perhaps B-Ball thought that the cluster of ships over on the western end of the map, including a Baltimore, could take care of the Tashkent, but you can see the Tashkent still has an awful lot of health. Despite the fact that the Implacable immediately vectored dive bombers on top of him, and dropped a fighter squadron on top of his head in order to keep him spotted. But, tier 8 carrier, there's a limit to what you can do. And the Tashkent has managed to get himself up against an island. And the only person in a real position to actually shoot at him at this point... Well, there's the Dmitry Donskoy there, and B-Ball here in the Minotaur, and neither of them were. And as a direct result of that, the Baltimore has been sunk by the Tashkent, although he did manage to get a flesh wound achievement for detonating the Tashkent with some shots that were in the air at the point where he died. So, okay, the Tashkent is dead, the end result is the same, but it cost the team Baltimore. And it needn't have, if more people, or in fact anybody other than the carrier, had bothered themselves to shoot at him. So, uh, a questionable decision there, I feel, from B-Ball. I mean, I don't know, I'm far from being an expert at World Warships, perhaps you can see a logic uh, that I couldn't. Perhaps you can see a logic to this that I couldn't. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the Lexington. <laughs> I guess he just got sick of losing all of his aircraft. <laughs> like I said, you're going to see some suspect decision making in this match. Some of it's so obviously suspect that all you can really do is laugh at it. And that's one of them. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I got nothing. I have no idea what the hell he was doing. Um, <laughs> Now that's a huge blow to the enemy team, because while their Lexington may not have been particularly good, even if he wasn't really damaging or sinking anything, he was at least sometimes spotting things. Sometimes he was even spotting things that other members of his team were able to shoot at. But anyway, as B-Ball is raining down death and destruction from the safety of his smokescreen on this buffalo, other members of his team are rushing forward to take advantage the Iowa, the Dmitry Donskoy, and momentarily at least the Chung Mu, who just got obliterated by the Yamato's secondaries. However, the Dmitry Donskoy, a little bit too keen to press the advantage on the Buffalo because he has rushed so far forward that he's got nowhere to go now, and has managed to basically pin himself up against an island right in front of that Alsace. And if he wants to get out of there, he's going to have to turn broadside on. The good news 
is that the Chung Mu, who just died to the secondaries of the Yamato, did manage to get his torpedoes away. And he has sunk the Yamato. B-Ball has finished off the Buffalo. The Donskoy clearly did not need to push so far ahead, and he realised his mistake, but in order to get into the cover of the islands, just up ahead, and he nearly did it, he had to turn broadside on to the 380mm guns of that Alsace. The Alsace, meanwhile, is also clearly suffering, and is making absolutely no effort to hide his broadside from the 16-inch guns of the Iowa, who just sent him to the great dockyard in the sky. So the two teams have been trading ships left, right and centre, and with the destruction of the Alsace, Beeble's team were momentarily ahead on ships, then the enemy Frederick the Great, over on the western side of the map, in that direction, finished off the Zhao, evening the score as far as the ships were concerned, but not as far as the points are concerned, because the enemy team have been in control of two of the caps for the majority of the game, and they are still way ahead on points. Now, Beeble's RPF and that very suspicious looking smoke screen over there are telling us that there is still one enemy ship on this side of the map which must be cleaned up before they can head further west to assist the rest of the team. That is the enemy Neptune. Now we're going to see something that looks like bad decision making but can be explained by the circumstances. There's the Neptune. The Neptune's a fairly good ship. I mean it's no match for a Minotaur. It's definitely no match for a Minotaur and an Iowa but it's still got fairly impressive guns, and yet this Neptune never once uses them. I suspect the reason is because he knows he is not going to win a gunfight with a full health Minotaur and an Iowa, and whoever that is, sending shots in from the other side of the map, and instead he's just trying to break detection and get out of there. But he's too close. He left it too late. He loitered around inside his smokescreen, hoping to go unnoticed until it was far too late for him to get out of there. So you can see why he made the decision to not fire the guns, but because he left it too late to break detection, he was always going to end up in a gunfight with the ships pursuing him. And not using the guns just meant that he died without doing any damage. So the number of ships, at least on each team, is once again even. The enemy team are, of course, still way ahead. And if Beeble's team, with less than 10 minutes to go, want to stand any chance of winning this match, they're going to have to either start sinking a whole bunch of ships, and the Iowa bless him has just done exactly that, he's knocked out the Des Moines, and that's great because the other thing that B-Ball's team are going to need to do is to start taking some of those caps. And the closest cap is Bravo in the centre of the map. And it's awfully exposed. There's only one island in there that you can hide behind, and the enemy team did, until the Iowa smacked the crap out of the Des Moines, did have two radars covering it. They still have the Moskva. So trying to stealth cap Bravo is not really on the table here. The enemy team seem to understand this as well. They know that they have to hold on to it, and they're moving forward. Beeble just launched his torpedoes in the direction of that Yamato. These torpedoes have a 10km range. The Yamato is out of range, but he is moving forward. So by the time the torpedoes reach their maximum range, Beeble is counting on the Yamato being in effective range. That's the theory, at least. This is the point where the Iowa makes a very brave move and commits to attacking the Yamato. And it's also the point where the Moskva and the Frederick the Great appear on the flank and seal his fate. Right now, it's already too late for the Iowa to do anything other than to continue the charge on that Yamato. If it was just the Yamato by himself, it would be a brave move, because the Yamato's 18.1-inch guns can overmatch the bow armor of the Iowa, and potentially citadeling from the front. Although there is some absolutely hilarious dispersion from some of the front gun turrets on the Yamato. Like that. Do you see that? That's, that's three shots from the same turret. <laughs> and they landed half a kilometer apart. Um, the Yamato is backing up. Um, which means, of course, that none of B-Ball's torpedoes are going to hit him. And the Iowa is now getting ripped apart by a crossfire, not just from the Yamato, but also from the Moskva, and from some shots fired from stealth, and the torpedoes coming out of the smoke screen, hiding the enemy Edinburgh over there. But he's committed to this attack. If he was to turn away in order to not be subjected to crossfire from the Moskva and the Frederick the Great, he would be giving broadside to the Yamato, and that would be suicide. As it is, 
his chances of survival are not looking pretty good, but he might still be able to take the Yamato with him, especially since he's being supported, or was being supported, by the friendly Implacable, who did manage to score a couple of torpedo hits on the Yamato. And in fact, the Implacable is coming back for more. Yeah, Tier 8 carriers can't do anything in Tier 10 battles. Well, not if you throw away all of your aircraft and your carrier in the first 10 minutes of the game. That Implacable may just be Tier 8, but he's having a huge contribution to the outcome of this match. There, the Yamato is down. Unfortunately, the Iowa is probably, well, no, didn't survive. That was a ballsy move from the Iowa, and if it hadn't been for the fact that he was getting crossfired by the Frederick the Great and the Moskva up there, he might have actually survived and been able to take the Edinburgh down as well. Unfortunately for the Iowa, and for the team in general, right after he committed to the attack on the Yamato, the flanking ships popped up, and from that point on, his fate was pretty much sealed. It was just a question of whether or not they were going to be able to trade him for the Yamato, and they did manage to do that. Unfortunately, for every ship that they sink, they keep losing one of their own. The team are also making absolutely no progress in putting any pressure on these capture points, and at this point, with less than five minutes of the game remaining, and the enemy team more than 400 points ahead, caps alone are not going to cut it. Kills are going to be required as well. Which means it's time for a spot of extremely vigorous and entirely unwelcome surprise butt sex for this Edinburgh, who really should have seen this coming. There's the Kraken Unleashed. The Edinburgh, of course, was turning in order to try to get torpedoes away. B-Ball was completely aware of that. That's why he had his Hydro running. None of those torpedoes are coming as any kind of surprise whatsoever. With the destruction of the Edinburgh, he's unspotted. And thanks to the Implacable throwing his dive bombers against that Moskva, he can take advantage, while being at this range, of being able to lob some shots, at least, over the island up ahead and still hit the Moskva without being detected. The Moskva, of course is once again spotted because he's shooting at the Kronstadt up there, who is under a lot of pressure. There's nothing the Kronstadt can do about getting shot at by the Moskva, who's charging him down hard, but he is keeping the island between himself and the guns of the Frederick the Great up there, which is greatly prolonging his life expectancy. Speaking of life expectancy, B-Ball has done very well throughout this match at keeping his health intact. However, we're rapidly approaching the point where he's going to have to start taking some actual risks in this game. He's been playing it very safe so far, and doing very well from playing it safe, but he's still got all of that health intact. Now, I'm not suggesting that he should start throwing himself recklessly against these two surviving enemy ships, because having all your health intact in a Minotaur doesn't actually mean an awful lot. It's a very lightly armored cruiser, and the Moskva, and the Frederick the Great both have some seriously big guns. And they can reduce that full health bar to nothing in a very, very short period of time. But the Moskva is completely focused, while getting dropped, more torpedoes from the Implacable, completely focused on the Kronstadt. It's probably going to kill the Kronstadt, but while he's busy doing that, he's just getting punished both by B-Ball and by the Implacable, who's managed to connect with even more torpedoes. So while they're almost certainly going to lose the Kronstadt, the enemy team, and they have lost the Kronstadt, but the enemy Moskva is not going to survive this encounter. Well done to the Kronstadt, he managed to get the trade against the Moskva, and yet, with only one enemy ship remaining, it is still not enough. The enemy team are still nearly 400 points ahead, there's only two minutes of this game remaining, and there's still 60,000 hit points worth of Tier 9 German battleship that needs to be sunk in order for B-Ball's team to win this match. And it's at this point where that Frederick the Great suffers from what I can only describe as a sudden and terminal rush of shit to the brain. All he has to do is keep his health pool intact for the next less than two minutes, and he's won. And he chooses to fight. B-Ball has smoked up, he's now farming damage on him. He's able to do this because the Implacable is keeping him constantly spotted. Yeah, somebody said Tier 8 carriers can't do anything in a Tier 10 battle. Clearly, the captain of that Implacable didn't get that particular memo. The Implacable is able to keep the Frederick the Great constantly spotted because he's moved his carrier right up into the cap point at Charlie, while staying hidden behind an island so there's virtually no downtime on cycling his aircraft squadrons. The Frederick the Great is actually pretty quick for a battleship. Oh, there's the High Caliber Award, by the way. And the Implacable is about to score even more torpedo hits. 
That German battleship is capable of a top speed of 30 knots. Now, he's not going to outrun a Minotaur, but he doesn't have to outrun him. He just has to get out of line of fire, and there's an island right there that right now he could have been safely hidden behind. But he chose to fight when he should have chosen to run away. If he'd managed to get behind the island, he'd still be getting attacked by the carrier, but, well, you can see how little damage the carrier's torpedoes are actually doing. The carrier and the Minotaur, on the other hand, are easily cap- well, not easily, I mean, <laughs> If that match had lasted another 17 seconds, they would have lost, because the enemy team were nearly 200 points ahead, and the match actually ended with 17 seconds to go, and the enemy team on 907 points. But thanks to some great teamwork between B-Ball in the Minotaur and the Implacable, they were able to capitalise on some extremely poor decision-making on behalf of the enemy team and turn what should have been a defeat into a fairly impressive victory. Personally, I think it's a criminal offence that the Implacable only ranked fourth on the team in that match. I mean, I don't want to take anything away from the Iowa. He played a very brave match. We didn't really see what the Yamato was up to, but he apparently did quite well too. But I, I feel that the Implacable should have ranked far higher. Based on spotting damage alone, should have ranked second on the team. Without that Implacable, this game would have been lost. But while he might not be a winner on the scoreboard, well, he, he is. He's just not ranked quite as highly as I believe he deserved, but he is at least a winner in our hearts. So, Bball 617 thank you very much for sending that one in. I really enjoyed watching and commentating on it, and hopefully the rest of you did too, because that is it for today. Before we go, here's a quick picture of a kitten trying to murder my finger. <laughs> because I've heard that putting pictures of cats on the internet is a surefire, guaranteed path to success. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.